I don't have a whole lot to say. You just preached a mini sermon there. Thank you for that. That was good. But when I heard about this series and Scott talking about it of risk takers, I was chomping at the bit to have the opportunity to speak. Uh, that's something I'm a, a bit of an adrenaline junkie and I love taking risks and I can't help it. Um, I love taking risks. There's, there's good risks that I've taken in life that have been God-driven, and there's bad risks I've taken that have been flesh-driven. Uh, one of my latest risk-taking, I have played soccer a lot of my life, and uh, from 5 to 25, took a break, getting married, having kids, doing things, put the soccer ball away, had my first child, had an identity crisis, started playing soccer again. Um, more years went by, getting older, getting slower, uh, and they, I saw where they came out with a 35-plus soccer league, and I was like, that's great. I won't have these 20-year-olds hacking at my ankles and trying to take me out and be a hero on the soccer field like they're in the World Cup. They're 35 and older, so they know what they're doing. We're just going to kick the ball around. Well, we had our first game last Sunday, and there's this guy on the other team I nicknamed Kamikaze Baldy. He was about six foot four, 240 pounds. And uh, in my third minute of playing soccer, never have I had an injury like this, but he was going to take a shot. I was coming across to block it, and he lost his balance after the shot and dropped his 240 pounds of inertia square in my sternum. And I felt my chest go, wee, wee. And I was like, oh, oh no. And uh, so that was minute three. Shook it off, caught my breath. Okay, here we go, back in the game. The last eight minutes of the game, Kamikaze Baldy shows back up and misses the ball completely and just full swing my right calf. I, I'm wearing jeans this morning because there's a lot of different colors under this pant leg that you don't want to see. So I'm on the injured reserve list of my 35-plus soccer team <laughs> week one. So I was sitting during worship so this leg would not swell up while I stood for 25 minutes. So um, some people have more wisdom in facing risks or not. A good friend of mine, John Almond, he comes to our church. I text him, say, hey, man, you want to jump in 35-plus league? And it wasn't even 30 seconds. He said, that sounds like a torn ACL. Like, he knew the risk, and he's like, no, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, there's other risks in life that I've taken that have been God-focused, and I want us to talk about how we take risks for the kingdom of God. And we've been talking for weeks of all these amazing people who have been risk-takers in Scripture that we have seen, and uh, I hope by the end of the service, that these risks that we have seen believers in God follow and do, that we can put your name, you can see your name of what God's calling you to do and to be, and what risks are you called to take. So I kind of wrote down a little bit of a list of some of the people we've been going through. Um, I give Chris a ton of credit. Uh, speaking on Jeremiah last week, that's a tough one. That's a hard one. Jeremiah in the Old Testament, he had a message of hard love to God's people. He had to bring a very condemning, harsh message um, that was going to ruffle a lot of feathers and upset a lot of people and be very offensive. So Jeremiah was a good one. Before that, we had Rahab, uh, a prostitute who brought in some of God's people to hide them and help them discover how they're going to take over this land and this kingdom and bring God's glory back. Um, Ananias, Scott, I think you spoke on Ananias, who was called to bring the challenging message, the challenging kick in the pants to the Apostle Paul to get him kick-started on his ministry. And Ananias had a purpose and had a word for Paul to get going the right direction. And that was really neat. Uh, another one was the blind man. I'm not really sure what risk he took, Scott. <laughs> I have to go back and listen to that one. 
But he, he had nothing to lose, everything to gain, right? And uh, we're all going to go back this week and listen to the blind man because I need to know what risk he took. But we also have Noah went 100% against culture. Everything was going this direction. He trusted God's word, what God told him to do, and he did it with a lot of kickback, with a lot of resistance. Uh, Noah had a big miss- uh, mission. Mary, the mother of Jesus, uh, divine pregnancy as a teenager, out of wedlock. That's a lot of risk. That's a lot of stuff um, the mother of, of Jesus had to take on. And then, of course, Jesus, the ultimate risk taker, the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate example. We spent a week on him. We got Nehemiah, Esther, Gideon. Uh, some of the other ones might come up in the future. Spoiler alert be like Peter, the apostle Peter, he was a fisherman, and God took him and took the way that he lived a risky life. He liked to take risks, do challenges, and, and Jesus took him under his wing and directed that uh, risk-taking for the gospel. So I hope that we can put our names there and we can see, we can see Scott took a risk for Christ for what God has called him to do, for Hugh, for Emily, for Dave, for Matt, and that we can leave here today understanding what God's calling us to do with his word, with his truth, um, and how he's designed our life. So some good risks I've taken in life uh, following God is Emily and I, we were married, we were pregnant. Um, She was pregnant, I wasn't. You know how that works. Uh, And... God was calling us away from our job and calling us away to, we didn't know what was next. And we had a baby ready to be born in about four weeks and and God gave us a peace and we were praying. He's like, Brandon, Emily, you guys need to step away from what you're doing and trust me. And so we birthed our first child unemployed. We had no job, but we knew God was calling us away from what we were doing and we had to trust him. We had to follow him. That took risk. Uh, everything in me, everything in a man, a provider, what the world says we need to be is, is to be safe and to be secure and to provide money for our family and put food on the table. And, and God says, quit your job. Those things don't line up. So we trusted him in that. And we did that. And we followed him. Uh, years later, that year later, not years later, um, I got back into the automotive industry, working on cars, and uh, I was making $13 an hour, single income family uh, with a newborn, figuring out what God's calling me to do, Uh, and he gave us, gave me the vision for my business, for My Honest Mechanic, and uh, with that vision came risk to start a business with a children, you know, with a child, with a spouse, and uh, and so we trusted him. I said, God, I need to go get a safe job. I need 401k. I need insurance. I need to put some money away for some sort of future plan that I don't know what it is, but that's what you're supposed to do. You know, and, and God said, I've got this. I've got this. I've got this. And every, every step along the way in our life, the peace of God overwhelms the decisions when we know. And we're going to get in some scripture about that, but... Even into that decision to start a business, uh, I quit my 13-hour job, $13 an hour job, to, to plan to start the business. And then the week after we quit, we found out we were pregnant with twins. Like, oh, yeah, that's, that's cool. You know, that's smart. That's, that makes sense. Start a business, risk everything, birth twins while having a 17-month-old. This is cool. Thanks, God. So I was total panic mode. What am I doing? So I was actually applying at some race teams and some dealerships and all this stuff. And God's like, you don't think I didn't know that you were going to have twins? You don't think, you don't think I didn't know? That's always his answer back. And it's, you, okay, you know, I get it. So trust him, follow him, do it. And he has provided all along the way, um, which has been incredible. And so it takes risk. It takes risk to be a follower of Christ. I don't know if You've experienced that yet or figured that out, but we have 
to take risks. And we see that all in the Bible of, of risk takers. So we're going to bounce around some passages today. Uh, and before we do, let, let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for being the good, good father. God, we stand here on this day to recognize fathers all around the world, Lord, and uh, Lord, we recognize you, uh, and I pray that we can recognize you as the Father every day, and uh, Lord, so teach us today, we're going we're gonna to pull up a chair, we're going to sit on your lap, we're going to get in your word, God, teach us something new today that you've never shown us before, and Lord, we're, our minds are open, our hearts are open, and we look forward to hearing from you today. It's in your name we pray, amen. So everybody got your Bibles? Echoing what Scott was saying earlier about technology, nothing beats a good old-fashioned paperback Bible. You open up this thing, it doesn't ding at you, it doesn't say, you know, so-and-so texted you, an email doesn't come in to say you messed up at your job, it's all just focus on him. And this is the way that I think it's meant to be. You don't want to hate on the Bible apps and the things that I depend on a lot too. But if you want to cut the noise, as Scott was talking about, and just be able to hear the voice of God, uh, a big part of cutting the noise is, is going to the good old paperback Bible and hearing his voice. So we're going to jump around a little bit and... Um, Again, when Scott was talking about this, I was chomping at the bit to get up here. Usually, he asks me to speak at times when I've had the privilege of being up here, but I was telling him and kind of elbowing him like, man, I've, I've got one. I love this. I love talking about risk-taking. Uh, if there's a slot for me, you can fit me in. I'd love to have the opportunity to get up here. And so, I just love it. I was talking to a racing friend the other day, and he was talking, he said it best that those of us that have a need for speed, um, it's a disease, and there's no cure for it. Anybody got the cure for the need for speed? But for me, if anything has an engine or wheels on it, I want to see how to take it to its limit and how fast it can go, and I am just stuck with that disease. It, I'm, I'm poisoned, but it's just part of who I am. I, I love going fast. I love pushing the limits, and um, to take that and put it into the passion of what God has called me to be as a, a follower of Christ, and what he's called all of us as believers, he is a God of risk. Uh, he, is, he pushes us to take chances. And we see that pattern all through Scripture that I think one of the greatest proofs of Christianity and one of the greatest proofs of the Bible and its validity is that there's no way you would make up some of these stories to help people believe in God or to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And it's, it's an interesting angle I learned in Bible college of, of just some of the things like the first people to see Jesus out of the tomb was women. And women in that culture, when this was being written, had, had not a lot of authority or value. And so if you're going to make up a story about the king of the universe... Uh, you're going to have a soldier or somebody in power or a priest, but that's not how God wrote it. That's not how God wrote the story, is that he used people of low power, of low authority uh, to do great things. I think we started this whole series off with Gideon. Gideon, a very sheepish farmer who was nervous to speak, nervous to do anything, and God took him and led him to lead his people and to, to lead an army uh, to defeat the enemy. And so God can use us. He can use us in our stuff. And it doesn't matter of our position. It doesn't matter our job title. It doesn't matter if we're married, if we're divorced, if we can have kids, if we don't have kids. It doesn't matter. It's, what matters is that we lay ourselves out for God to be used. Amen? So i got a couple passages uh, Romans chapter 10, flip over there. Some of this is a little bit of review. I did a message on this maybe two years ago, 
And I just have such a heart for evangelism and sharing the gospel. Uh, One really fun adrenaline rush is to share the gospel with a complete stranger. Has anybody ever done that? Sitting on an airplane, you don't know the guy next to you, and you've got two hours to drop the G on him, drop the gospel, and see what happens. You know, that is fun. Uh, Going to a mall and walking and meeting a complete stranger, sitting down with somebody and just talk with them. Like, some of you probably have anxiety stirring in your heart just thinking about that. Like, I'm not going to talk to no stranger. But try it. Embrace it. It's fun. It gets more fun the more you do it. And so I have a huge heart for evangelism. Every time I speak, I think um, evangelism shows up some way, shape, or form. And I need to continue to get better at it. So that's why I'm always digging in it. So Romans chapter 10, verse 13 to 15. Here's, here's our mission as risk takers, what we're called to do. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. You're going to hear this a few times this morning, but who thinks there is a need in the world today for some good news? Yeah, there's not a lot of good news floating around. Uh, A lot of bad news, a lot of sad news, a lot of false news. Um, And so we have been empowered. We have been equipped to take the good news into the world. And our world needs good news. They need us to get out of these chairs and go into the world and share good news Uh, because we're being a little bit overwhelmed with bad news for several years now as a nation. And uh, it's our calling to, to bring the good news. So the question is, why, why take the risk? Why should we take the risk? And I think as we scroll over here to Matthew 22, why One why is that we are commanded. We are told by God that it's our mission. I think sometimes uh, people say evangelism is a spiritual gift, and some people have it and some people don't. And I believe that. I mean, there's evangelists that, you know, the Billy Grahams of the world, that's That's a gift, and that's incredible. And and what God was able to do in and through him and what he's still doing out of that evangelist. But I think in a certain level, all of us are called and commanded to share the good news in some way, shape, or form. So whether we make a career out of it or it's just what naturally pours out of us for being followers of Christ, it is what we're called to do. So check this out. Matthew 22, verse 37 to 39. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I think there's always an analogy, Scott was kind of using one there, about that pill you take, that if you had to take a pill that keeps you alive every single day, and if you miss it one day, you die. Uh, In the same way, loving your neighbor as yourself, being a follower of Christ, we we have the good news that the world needs to hear, and we are to share it. If we had the cure for cancer, and and you were a scientist, and you were in the lab for years and years and years and years, and you stirred it up, and you figured it out, and you solved cancer, uh, you would share that with the world. You would share that with your neighbor who's battling cancer, with your friend, with the news, you'd get all over the place that cancer is cured and I found it. In the same way, I think the gospel is a larger cure than cancer. Isn't that right? Cancer or no cancer, we need the gospel. We need the Christ. We need Jesus. And we need, we have the opportunity to spend eternity with him in heaven. And that is through this message. And so we need to get out and share it and love your neighbor as yourself. Turn a few more pages over, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. This is a great 
commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So those were some of the final words Jesus said before he ascended into heaven, and he said, go and do. Here's what I showed you, here's the example I gave you. Now multiply, now duplicate it. Make disciples who make disciples. And it was the last thing Jesus said before he ascended into heaven. And so I think that's pretty important. If you think about a tombstone, you think about what's the message you want to leave behind? What's the last thing you want to say in your dying breath? Luckily, our Savior defeated death, came back, had a lot more things to say. But this is, this is how he left it. And this is how far we've come. So we're called... To be risk takers, we're called to share the gospel. We're called to share our testimony. Um, I think we'll get into this a little bit, but some people get intimidated by, well, I don't know how to answer the problem of evil. I don't really understand how to answer these questions uh, that people are going to ask, so I'm not, I'm not going to go and ask and look like a dummy and put my foot in my mouth. Well, I think one of the greatest evangelism tools that, that can't be touched is your testimony. What, how did Christ change your life? How did your life go from what it was to what it is now? What did he bring to you? And that testimony, that message from your heart, from your life, from your experience of being connected to the creator of the universe is powerful. And that cannot be argued. Uh, and it is truth. So at the very least, you know what Christ has done for you. And you stay on that path. We'll keep going. Uh, so that's it. I led my way into that. How do I take the risk? How do, you, how do you engage somebody with the gospel? How do you know what God's calling you to do? Uh, Ananias had a, had a message from God. God told him what to say and go. He told him exactly where to go. He told him exactly who to talk to, exactly who to ask for. And he obeyed and he did it. You know, I think God can give us those same things. I think he gave it to me in my job and career changes. He gave it to me uh, in the vision for starting a family and starting a business and, and taking those risks. And so he can give that to us too. But here's one big one. Again, this shows up every time I think I speak, Romans 12, 1 and 2 shows up. Uh, I think it's important and I have to repeat it in my mind daily. Because the big nugget in the center of it is be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And the big reality of that is what are we renewing our mind with? What are we renewing our mind with? And the easy answer is, of course, the Bible and prayer. And, but also we renew our mind with other things. We renew our mind with whatever news app we follow, with whatever movies we watch, with whatever friends we hang out with is renewing our mind, whether it's, it's good or bad. And so sometimes I stop and think, like, how much of my day and how much of my thought process is being renewed by this versus what that phone is telling me and what that next news article pops up to tell me. And there, there's a competition of what we're renewing our minds with. So we need to make sure that we're overwhelming our minds with the good news outside of what the world tells us. Right? Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. And so that one, I always, I always stop there. Give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. Uh, he doesn't want just your 10 bucks in the offering plate. He doesn't want a Sunday participation award. He doesn't want two out of seven days of the week. He wants all of you. He wants every day. Uh, he deserves all of us. He deserves every day. And 
A funny analogy I heard at a youth conference one time with this Bible verse is the guy went down and he grabbed the big golden offering plate and he put it on the ground and he stood in it and he told the usher to carry him off because I'm all in. Uh, everything, like Romans 12.1, it's everything. God says, get in the offering plate. Don't just give me your 10 bucks, give me everything. And so it keeps going here. The big nugget here. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. We all know we're in a battle that's not against flesh and blood. We're in a spiritual battle every day. Uh, what we watch, what we see, what's happening in our world, a lot of the tragedies we've been seeing lately, you know, I don't see, it's not the gun's fault. It's not the lack of security's fault. It's a, it's a spiritual battle within that individual and with what is around him, you know. There's a, there's a little, bit, little bit of sidebar. I was thinking of Father's Day is what I've been learning of being a dad and as I studied the word being a dad, the word kind of has changed a little bit. And I have seen most of the world's problems is because of daddy issues. The lack of a father. The lack of leadership in someone's life. And the calling to be a father is the biggest calling. Ladies, we love you. We love celebrating Mother's Day. None of us would be here without moms. Dads, our job is to lead and to lead well, and to set examples for our children and our children's children. Um, I went to a good friend's parents' 50th wedding anniversary yesterday. And some good friends of mine, they moved all over the country now, but they got to celebrate 50 years of marriage. And it was really neat. It was led by the dad. It was led by the husband. And he called it a nanniversary because he wanted all the attention to go to his wife and to the grandmother, the great grandmother. And it was just so neat to, to see his leadership and to lead his family and to see his kids who had kids and some of them have had kids and this generational family of godly people because it was led by a good father who had a good father. And I was just thinking of it too as, as I was sitting there like Lucifer had some daddy issues right? Like, God wasn't good enough for him. His position was not good enough, and the problem of evil started with him having some, some daddy issues. I don't know. There's probably some real theological problems with that, but uh, seriously, if he were just submitted to his father and followed his leadership, man, we'd all still be in paradise. Um, scroll over to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, 6 through 8. This is just a huge life verse, again, that go to daily, sometimes hourly, sometimes minute by minute. Here, as I've gotten older and I've gotten my 30s and I've gotten the late 30s, I've, I've developed a little bit of anxiety. I don't know why. I don't like it. I hate it. It's like a thorn in the side. And anxiety is the opposite of peace. God is a God of peace. And, and chaos and anxiety and worry is the opposite of God. And so we have to, when the world throws that at us, when our flesh throws it at us, sometimes it's chemical, sometimes it's spiritual, that um, we've got to Go back to the place of peace and God's peace. And looking at this, Philippians 4, verse 6 through 8. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And just stop in there for a second. Making decisions. This was, this was just a big thing here. Making decisions whether 
to go over to your neighbor's house and share the gospel for the first time, to be intentional about it, or to, to the random person at the mall or whatever. How do you do it? How do you take the risk? You get to a place of peace that only God can give you. And God will give you the peace of that person to talk to. But also in life decisions, uh, all these decisions we made to leave our job or to start a business or to go here, or go there. Um, so thankful to have a godly wife and a wonderful lady who, who follows God just as hard as I do. And we're running after him as hard as we can. And so we both, many crises in our life, we come together in peace and in unity. And we know that's only because God is in the center of it. And so if you're looking to make decisions, buy a house, um, move somewhere, uh, a medical decision, you go with where God gives you peace. And that's always been a a filter of mine. I, I can think of when I'm really praying to make a decision in life, I can think of one silly example of, of, of not going with God's peace, but just going with my flesh, and it kind of ties into our life story. I really wanted a Subaru, and I really wanted uh, more of a race car Subaru, uh, something that goes fast. Well, here's, here's me and Emily making 13 bucks an hour, got a first child, saw the new Subaru Outback. It was actually very identical to Brian's that he used to own. And uh, I was like, well, I can't have the fun car, but this is kind of in between. It's not a minivan, but it's not a rally car. It's, a, it's an Outback. This is cool. And so Emily and I are sitting in the car dealership. And here I am, a mechanic, who I vowed I would never buy a brand new car because I can fix them. I'll buy them broke and fix them and be a better situation. Well, we lost our brains that day. We didn't really ask God. We bought this brand new car, super pumped. Look at this nice thing. We're a family. We're living the American dream. And uh, three weeks later, we find out we're pregnant with twins. So we already have one kid. The Outback only has one row of seats in the back. So we just dropped 30K plus on a car that no longer will fit our family. And, I look, and we look back, and I was like, man, I was sitting at that table, and I was praying, and God was saying no, and I was saying yes, and I went with yes. And now we, we made this investment. And so he still took care of us. We did sell that car as soon as the twins showed up because they didn't even fit in it. And eventually we caved to the minivan life. Uh, and I had to humble myself before the Lord <laughs> for sliding doors. But I didn't have the peace. And those big decisions in life, you need to have the peace of God. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Um, the rest of that verse Verse 8, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Has anybody ever found a news station that that's their, that's their plan? <laughs> I think it's... The opposite. News feeds off of chaos, fear, worry, questionable information because it gets people watching it. It gets people talking about it. And it gets people to watch it over and over again. And, to, and to, you got to go back to that 6 o'clock news because what kind of crazy chaos are we going to hear tonight? You know, it's like a terrible sitcom. But us as believers... We are called to fix our thoughts. Do you want peace in your life? Focus on what is true. That's a hard thing our society is battling with is what is true? What is truth? That's been asked a long time in philosophy, but now in America more than ever that I've seen is what is true. It has been a real battle, uh, and we are called to seek that out and stay in the word and, and share it with others True, honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, worthy of praise. That should be what's pouring out of our lives. Whatever's pouring out on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, if it's not this, we're, we're doing a disjustice to uh, Christ and, and who, what flag we carry of being a follower of Christ. So 
Stay there. Stay there every day. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. That's how we arm ourselves to get ready for the day. And I hope you guys can do that too. Let's keep going deeper into the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter 3, verse 15 to 17. says this. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants and to suffer than for, to suffer for doing wrong. So this is always a big evangelism tool um, to be used. Always be prepared to give an answer. Do you feel ready to explain why you believe what you believe? That's, that's very important. I think that's something my generation missed in, in church and being raised in church. There wasn't a lot of why. It just is. Jesus just is. And believe it. And follow it. And read the Bible. But why do we believe what we believe? That's a question... I think as I was a youth pastor for 10 plus years, we would study the, we'd see the statistics of the percentage of kids, 75% of kids walk away from their faith when they go to college. Well, why is that happening? Why did they just spend their entire childhood in church and then go to college and lose it like it was nothing? It's because they didn't know why. Why do they believe what they believe? Why, when that person at college is is speaking about Hinduism or Buddhism or the new age, become one with the universe, all those things sound great. And I don't really know why. So if that's good with them, it's good with me now too. And so it's very important right here in First Peter, always be prepared, always be ready to explain it, always know the why. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Uh, I went to the races a couple weeks ago out here, and every time there's these bullhorn guys with signs up in the air that's a condemnation gospel, you're all going to hell. And uh, I was walking by these guys, it was me and Sean. I gave Sean some VIP access to the race, and we went in the pits and did the whole thing. It was fun. And uh, But out in the fan zone, there's four guys dominating the intersection in front of the racetrack, and... They're just, repent, repent or go to hell, repent or go to hell. And got the little speaker on their hip, and they got their poster board that they drew up and prayed over. And um, my challenge to them, which I've tried to challenge them in the past, is this passage. And are we doing this out of gentleness and respect? Or are we pushing more people away than we're drawing to Christ? And it definitely feels a little pushy. And uh, it's funny, he was yelling at a, a lady who was wearing inappropriate clothes and her shorts were too short, you know, and I just kind of want to elbow him and say, well, what are you looking at, you know? You just looked at it. You're going to hell. Come join us. You know, like, <laughs> what are you doing? You're not helping. So I think in our, in our culture, this term called cancel culture, it's, it's heavy right now. It's, it's a new thing that seems to be fun um, and and the cancel culture is if kind of if you're not for me then we're against you uh, if the church is not for homosexuality and marriage then we're done with you you're dead to us anything you have to say um, is no good because here's what we say and here's what we stand on you know there's so many different things you can go political left wing right wing if you think X, then you're worthless because you don't think what I think. There's so much of that going on in the last few years of politics and world and agenda that, that we're facing that. And it's causing a lack of unity. But what we can do is when somebody shows hate, we can actually love them. We don't have to respond hate with hate. 
That's what we want to do. We want to blow them up, right? You want to throw all the information that counter, counters their argument. But we can respond to them out of love. You don't have to agree with somebody to love them. And what the world needs is somebody that needs the church to love them even if we don't agree with them. Amen? So what's at risk besides being late for lunch right now? Sorry about that. Um, I don't know. What, what is at risk? What is at risk to share the gospel? What is the risk to go public with your faith, to not keep it in on a Sunday morning? What's at risk? Uh, so there's a couple cool passages here. I'll try to go through them quickly. Luke chapter 6. Head over to the gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 6, verse 22 and 23. Jesus kind of gives us a really big heads up here about what's going to happen. And he also encourages us in it. Jesus speaking, Luke 6, verse 22 and 23. What blessings await you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man? When that happens, be happy. Yes, Leap for joy, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember their ancestors treated the ancient prophets the same way. There's going to be pushback. There's going to be, there's going to be tension. There's going to be offense at times. Uh, and I think going to the question of what's at risk, you might be rejected. You might be removed from a text group your Twitter account might be deleted. We know that happened to our ex-president. It can happen. You can be deleted. Um, you know, you can lose a friend if you finally step up to the plate and share the good news with them and they disagree. It might not be the same. But you know what? Our, our responsibility is, is to present the gospel to them. And so we're called to it. We got to do it. Back over here, 1 Peter chapter 4, 14 through 16. This is another one of these wonderful messages. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed. Really? For the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. Amen. That needs no explanation. And then one more real quick, Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Jesus speaking again, just to remind us. Verse 19 and 20. Don't store up your treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. Our goals of investments, our goals of, of what conversations really matter, I think as I was preparing for this, one note that I wrote to myself that I'm just super frustrated with myself is, is constantly talking to my neighbors about the weather. Like that's a real thing. Oh man, beautiful day today, or me and my neighbor will be outside watering our grass, hoping it'll survive the next 100 degree day. We'll keep some sort of shade of green in our yard, and we're just out there watering. Yeah man, heard a heat wave's coming, and I've spent years living next to some neighbors that I haven't told them my story. I haven't told what Christ has done in my life. And if, if I live in this neighborhood this entire time and they never hear the good news from me, I feel like I failed at the opportunity that God gave me. God has you in the neighborhood that you are in. He has the neighbors next to you for a reason. He has you at the job. He has you for a reason. And it's all there for the people that are around you. It is all there that that's your opportunity to be used by God. Uh, the family that you're in, the in-laws that you love, or 
that you love, you're in that family for that reason, and that's an opportunity to do that. So store up our treasures in heaven. Let's make investments in heaven. And he has, he has equipped us. I'm going to skip a couple verses here. But I'm going to go over to 2 Timothy 3.16 real quick. It says this, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. Where do we find truth? Scripture. And to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. He has equipped us with his word. It's one more Romans chapter 5. I love flipping pages in the old paper bag. Just feels good. Verse Romans 5, 6 through 11. When we were utterly helpless, think about your testimony, think about your story, think about what do I have to share? What can I communicate to my neighbor, to the person next to me on the airplane? When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. He's bridged the gap. We have the ability to be in relationship with the creator of the universe. Every other belief system, for the most part, in the world, is based on works. What you can do, what you can earn, what stage of heaven you're going to be in, what kind of creature you'll be when you come back next time, uh, which God will you become, how will you dissolve into the universe. Works, 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 works. Christianity is, Christ did it. The work has been done. You just have the opportunity to have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus. And it's an incredible, unique message that all of us flesh built. We, it's just natural that we have to do and earn and score points and get that trophy or get that promotion or do, do, do. And the creator of the universe wrote the story to the opposite of that. I've done it. I did it. I sent my son. I was the best father on Father's Day. I sacrificed for you so you all could be my children. And so he did it. And so we see there's a trend in this uh, Risk Taker series that all these people were not perfect. They didn't get everything in order before God used them. Um, They had Rahab for goodness sake, and um, all these other situations. Again, Gideon, the farmer who just wanted to hide under a rock and not be used. Um, Matthew, the tax collector in the New Testament, he was very hated in his culture. And so God can take all through history, all through the Bible, we see how God used the unlikely. He used people that you wouldn't normally think we're good for this opportunity and all of us we're pretty we're pretty everyday people we're in this concord community Uh, nothing big and huge is necessarily coming out of concord Uh, but we all each one of you sitting here today and listening can be used by god and i just have this little analogy uh where's my artsy artsy people in the room got any artists i've got a picture here does anybody know what this picture's from, who painted it, I heard it, Monet, yes, so there's a famous painter from the late 1800s, early 1900s, 
uh, Claude Monet. That was part of his backyard. It's part of his property that he created. And of this property, he had over 250 paintings of it. And when I look at that, I go there. I go back to my childhood where I went swimming in my aunt and uncle's pond and it had lily pads and it was disgusting. <laughs> like lily pads are not beauty to me. They're slimy, they're gross, they're algae. They grow because the water is stagnant. There's weeds all over that. There's trees that are overgrown. Um, it just It looks like an overgrown swamp with a bridge over it. You know? And... This painting back in 2015, I don't know any updated sales, but just one of the 250 paintings sold for over $50 million. Mr. Monet is rolling over. It's like, man, that was just my backyard pond. And that, I think, is just a, a beautiful picture of, of us, a beautiful picture of beauty that has been taken and escalated like the value in that. God sees us that way. Uh, sometimes we get caught staring at the lily pads. We're looking at our lives and we're like, that's gross. That's sticky. That's slimy. I'm not going to put that on display. Um, you know, those overgrown weeds, I'd really like to take care of those first. The shoreline of the pond looks really messy. So before I paint this, I, wanna, I want perfection. You know, God... He's not waiting for that. We don't have to wait to remove the algae. We don't have to wait to trim the weeds before we can be used by God. And that's just the big idea. And the, the last passage I just want to share, uh, I have a quote here that I just wanted to, to type up on the screen. I don't want to say it wrong, but here's the reality of being risk takers. What does it look like for you to be a risk taker, just as these people in the, in the Bible. God is in the business of making masterpieces out of broken and unexpected people. God looks at you and sees a masterpiece. And God wants to use you. So Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you cannot take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. There's a couple things here. As we were talking about the message of Christ is so different than other belief systems in the world. This is the monumental verse that divides it. For it is not by works so that no one can boast. It is a gift of God because we were saved by grace. And then, not only that, we are God's masterpiece. Like I laugh at that a lot because I went through a phase where I liked astronomy. I'd stare into the sky and I'd see these constellations and I'd see these planets and I'd see all of this. And God says, I'm, I'm bigger and better than that part of his creation. I think it's pretty neat that you created a solar system and gravity and everything that makes us survive. That, you know, if the earth was just off a couple more degrees, we'd all be toast or we'd all be frozen. And like God put all that in place. And yet the people that we've lived all our lives out on this one planet is his masterpiece. And so don't let the enemy lie to you and tell you you're nothing, that you've got too many lily pads, there's too much algae going on, uh, there's too many weeds overgrown, I can't be used by him. But we have everything we need, and we just have to follow his lead. We have to submit to him. So I want you guys to stand up. Stand up. I was thinking as I was writing this down, <clears throat> I've done a few weddings, and uh, you do the, the vows and repeat after me, and this kind of feels funny, but 
we're gonna, I want you guys to repeat after me. I am God's masterpiece. He has created me anew in Christ Jesus. So I can do the good things. He planned for me long ago. He 